Well, welcome to Coffee with Job. Uh, this one is, I don't know, I think it's kind of special because we're going to commemorate somebody as well and we're going to see how what applied in Job is reality. A number of weeks ago, in fact, it wasn't that long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I received a message from Melvin Tinker telling me how he and his wife had so appreciated what we were looking at particularly in Romans, actually. Well, we're going to say something about Melvin later on, but we'll, let's turn to the passage in Job 22, uh, the last part of Eliphaz's speech, which is probably one of the greatest calls to believe and to, and to repentance that you will ever read. And, and we're going to go from verse 21, and I just want to go through it. First of all, he says, Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Submit to God. Agree with him is what it means. It's, it's an acknowledgement that God is God. It's an acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord, that we're us trying to get our own way. No. We submit to God. Accept instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. Take on board what God says in his word. That's what we're trying to do here. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove wickedness far from your tent and assign your nuggets to the dust, your gold of Ophir to the rocks and the ravines, then the, the Almighty will be your gold. The choice is silver for you. Submission, repentance, turning back, turning to God, listening to God's word, giving up your idols, giving up your gold, giving up the things that matter most to you, handing them all to the Lord, this is a great description of what it is to become a Christian. Then, here are the rewards, the blessings of all this. The Almighty will be your gold. Surely then you will find delight in the Almighty and will lift up your face to God. You have the delightful presence of God. To know the presence of God. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced any of this, but there are times in my life, sadly, too few and too far between, when I've been deeply conscious of the presence of God. I, I know that God is present all the time, but I know that with my head, but a, a, a felt Christ is, is what I need and what we need. And to know the presence of God, there, there was once in, in Livingston in Scotland that I had such a foretaste of heaven coming out of church that I remember walking along the, the, the road thinking I was going to die because I just thought, Lord, I, you, don't send me back. I, I, I want to be with you. It was an extraordinary experience I've never forgotten. I think it's probably the strongest in, in, in all of that. You'll have the delightful presence of God. Your prayers will be heard. You'll pray to him and he will hear you and you'll fulfill your vows. What you decide on will be done and light will shine on your ways. When people are brought low and you say lift them up, then he will save the downcast. He will deliver, deliver even one who is not innocent, who will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. It's God blessing you and through you blessing others. So it's a great call, but Job is already doing this. Here's the problem with this. It's a great call, but Job is already doing it. Christopher Ash puts it this way, to press this believer to repent of sins he has not committed is a grotesque rape of his integrity. I note in passing how in today's society, we're constantly being asked to repent of sins and say sorry for things that we have not committed. I find all this historical aspect or collective guilt that people try and impose upon you. I, don't, I, I can't repent for other people and I'm not going to repent of sins that I haven't done just for the sake of, of signaling to people. I've got real sins in my own life that I have to repent of. And yet... This is just wonderful stuff because Jesus repented of sins that he didn't do in a sense. He repented for us. He was convicted of sin. He was made sin for us. I was reading in uh, Thomas Manton uh, and I just absolutely love this. Uh, that the heathens, all their mercies come to them swimming in the blood of Christ. So the word, ordinance, is covenant and outward graces to the church. Thus he suffered for the sins of the whole world, that the, the whole should enjoy these common favours and blessings by him. 
And Manton goes on to talk about Jesus suffering for the sins of the whole world, but he also talks about how there's a particular application. Though Christ's death be sufficient for all, yet the efficacy and benefit of it is intended only to believers, to those who enjoy it by faith, not only applied, but intended only. And I think, you know, there is a sufficiency in the death of Christ for all of us, and we are commanded to lay hold upon him and to come, as, as Eliphaz says, to come repenting, to come um, submitting, to come believing his word, and then we will find delight, then we will pray. Now, let me return to Melvin Tinker. You know, our time has gone for this, but I do want to say something about Melvin. Now, Melvin died this week, and I found myself profoundly moved by it. I, I don't think I ever met Melvin. Spoken to him several times. Uh, we, I've interviewed him several times online. Uh, love his book, That Hideous Strength, which I'm just writing a, a thing for Christian Today, which will appear in it as well. Again, and I've already written extensive reviews on it. It, it. For me, if you want to understand what's going on in our culture, this is the number one book I would give to Christians in your church. And then I've just been reading this. He and I were going to talk about this. We were set up to do a podcast on his The Comfort of the Triune God in Revelation. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Let me... Uh, just this short two-minute clip of an interview we did with Melvin, which will show you the measure of the man. The, the other thing, it, it's it, everything that Steve says is absolutely right, it's, it's, but it's, it's more than Jesus not being mentioned, it's Jesus not being present. Mm, so, for example, in, in the book of Revelation, you have the letter to the church in Laodicea, and this seems to have everything going for it. I mean, it's probably having a jolly, jolly old time worshipping and everything else. But it's interesting that Jesus is on the outside knocking to be let in. He's not present mm -hmm. because they become so worldly and so therefore useless. That's what Jesus means when he says, you're, you're, um, well, I will spew you out of my mouth because you like lukewarm water. It's not that they're lukewarm, rather hot than cold. It's just that they're useless, absolutely useless. And therefore, they're in danger of ceasing to be a church. But they're still given a chance. Mm. Jesus is knocking on the door saying, let me in. If they yeah. let him in things will be well. So Jesus has got to be present. And that also means his transforming presence. Mm. So there are plenty of churches where, if you like, they may be sound and the word is preached. But in terms of it being translated into, into people's lives and changed lives and engaging with culture, sometimes, sadly, it, it's lacking. So do you think, Melvin, um, that we could have our churches that are very clear and correct on things, but they're not very healthy churches to go to if someone wants to explore what difference would Jesus make in my life as I live my day-to-day -day life? Sadly, yes. Uh, I know some that would be, um, you know, would be able to tick all the, the boxes in terms of orthodoxy and would claim to be preaching sound sermons. But there's no application. There's no engagement. There's a, there's a, there's a, just, there's a credibility gap, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why, uh, uh, for me, it's not simply a matter of being known as an evangelical, a Bible believer, um, but it's being a consistent evangelical. And, and if we're not, um, basically, I mean, we're all sinners, and that's all part of the gospel, the glory of the gospel, that we can repent and we come under grace. But if there's such a gap between what is said and what we claim to believe and the way we behave, and that is when the, the non-Christian rightly turns around and says, well, if that's Christianity, I don't mm. want to do it. I'd say it's not Christianity. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that wonderful? And then, you know, the fact that he's died. I, there's this sorrow that I feel, a sorrow for the church. Maybe the Lord took him because of the pain that's coming upon the church. We can ill afford to lose him sorrow for his family. For me, there's a little, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not claiming he was my best friend or anything like that, but there's a personal sorrow because I feel he was a real kindred spirit and a brother, a fellow soldier, and he's gone, but he's not gone. As we, we say so often, he's more alive than ever. And in this book, he cites uh, about heaven. I'd love to read it, all of you. 
Um, he cites in, in, a, in a section entitled All Heaven is of God, he says, no one has described this reality better than Jonathan Edwards. And I'm going to leave you with this. This is profoundly, profoundly beautiful. Listen to this. Weep for joy. Melvin is here now. God is the inheritance of the saints. He is the portion of their souls. God is their wealth and treasure. By the way, we were just seeing that in Job, weren't we? Their food, their life, their dwelling place, their ornament and diadem, and their everlasting honor and glory. They have none in heaven but God. He is the great good which the redeemed are received to at death and which they are to rise to at the end of the world. The Lord God, he is the light of the heavenly Jerusalem. And it is the river of the water of life that runs and the tree of life that grows in the midst of the paradise of God. The glorious excellencies and the beauty of God will be what will forever entertain the minds of the saints and the love of God will be their everlasting feast. How envious I am of Melvin, by the way. He is enjoying that without all the distractions of this life and without all the stumbling of our own sin and without all the corruption in the church. He is glorified as the body of Christ is glorified. Let me continue with what Edward says. The love of God will be their everlasting feast. The redeemed will indeed enjoy other things. They will enjoy the angels and will enjoy one another. But that which they enjoy in the angels or each other or anything else whatsoever that will yield them delight and happiness will be what will be seen of God in them. I saw something of Christ in Melvin. He reassured me enormously. He encouraged me enormously. I felt a love for him, for somebody I hadn't met that was real and the idea that he is now perfected in heaven and in glory makes me want to go there, makes me want to serve Christ as faithfully as I can on this earth and there are decisions and battles that I know that I'm going to have to face in, in the coming weeks but I'm thankful that I keep my eyes on Jesus and I see the example of those who've gone before. I won't pray that Melvin will rest in peace because he is resting in glory and in joy and in peace. And I pray for you and for me that we will join him there in the worship before the throne of the Lamb. God bless you. See you tomorrow. Bye.